economics is the study of people and the choices they make. In fact, the definition of an economy is a system for the allocation of a society's scarce resources, but economics is presented like it's some sort of niche scientific study of money and wealth. Economics is a social science, not a hard science. The economy is us. The major schools of economics are Keynesianism, which is generally for government intervention, the Chicago School of Economics, which is generally for minimal intervention in the market and limited government, and the Austrian School of Economics, which is generally for no intervention in the market at all, hence total laissez-faire. What is Austrian economics? The starting point is the study of purposeful human action. We all weigh up alternatives and make decisions upon which we act, but economics is not concerned with the psychology of such choices, but with which actions were chosen. For Austrians, prices in the real economy are always based on these subjective preferences which we inherently cannot measure. Austrians argue that other economists, despite claiming to believe that value is subjective, end up forgetting this when modelling prices in their hidden assumption that production costs determine prices. Austrians insist that production costs do not determine prices, only subjective preferences. Because we cannot know what people's subjective preferences and valuations of things are, Austrians reject the idea that economics can be a hard science, like for example physics. They argue you cannot predict what people may or may not do because human beings are not like stones which react to conditions in predictable ways and besides, you can never get constant variables in the real world anyway. The key Austrian contributions to economic theory have been marginal utility, which was advanced by Karl Menger and concerns the subjective theory of value I have already discussed. Imagine you are thirsty in a desert in the baking sun what would you give for a glass of water? Now imagine you've just finished drinking a whole pint of water. What would you give for the next glass? I'd warrant it would be considerably less than you'd give if you were thirsty in the desert. Another key Austrian contribution, this time from Friedrich von Weiser, is the idea of opportunity cost, which is simply put the loss of other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. We face such choices all the time in real life. Imagine the choice between seeing a movie with your friends or studying hard to get a good grade for the examination you have the next day. The opportunity cost for studying hard is foregoing the enjoyment of the movie and spending time with your friends. However, the cost of seeing the movie is a lower grade on the exam. Next, there is the concept of time preference, introduced by Eugene bom if I offer you the choice between $100 today or $100 in one month's time, the chances are you'll go for the $100 today. This is your preference for having something now instead of in the future. If I offer you £10 today or $100 in one month's time, you might have a more difficult choice. Can you forgo the $10 now to make the $100 in a month? This would be a low time preference. If you take the $10 today, we'd say that you have a high time preference. You prefer to consume the $10 now than have $100 in a month. Another famous concept is the economic calculation problem. In the absence of a market economy, socialist systems would not know how to allocate resources effectively because they are missing prices as signals of what people want. One of the theories for which the Austrian school is famous is their theory of the business cycle, which argues that most of the boom-bust cycles we see in the modern economy are caused by expansionary credit. This was first outlined by Ludwig von Mises in 1912 in his landmark book called The Theory of Money and Credit. Lots of people instinctively know the Austrians are correct about this, and yet very little has been done to stop boom and bust cycles in the hundred years since Mises first introduced the theory. 
Inflation, as this term was always used everywhere and especially in this country, means increasing the quantity of money and banknotes in circulation and the quantity of bank deposits subject to check. But people today use the term inflation to refer to the phenomenon that is an inevitable consequence of inflation. That is the tendency of all prices and wage rates to rise. The Austrian definition of inflation is that inflation is the increase in the money supply. It is not an increase in prices. An increase in prices is the effect. So you can think of the disease as being inflation, increase in the money supply, and the symptom being rising prices. So it's the increase in the money supply that sets in motion a process which ends up resulting in rising prices. Now, there can be a lag to this. The money printing and increasing the bank reserves and the amounts that banks can lend, it does not immediately cause inflation and there's a lag and that depends on several factors. So far, most of it has been contained to asset prices, but most recently with the stimulus checks, it's getting into the hands of more consumers and that's why we're starting to already see higher consumer price inflation. And one thing you need to think about with regards to inflation, you could have a completely stable price and you're actually still be getting hurt by inflation because you've missed out on what would have otherwise been a decrease in the price. Let's say Apple iPhones are getting better, productivity is increasing, things are getting more efficient. If there wasn't this manipulation of the money supply, those prices would be going down and you'd be seeing real savings. However, by increasing the money supply, the, the price level might stay the same. You're still losing out. You've got that foregone deflation that you would have experienced without the inflation. When you think about prices, you need to think about them as containing information. The two types of information they convey are monetary information. So what you know, what is the monetary effect on these prices, which is when they're messing with the money supply or suppressing interest rates. And there's also real information in prices and real information might be increases in efficiency. Prices might be coming down like TVs and certain technology. We see it becomes less expensive as it becomes less expensive to produce it. However, these all get obscured with the large amount of monetary interference we have by the Federal Reserve suppressing interest rates which are the most important price in the economy. Austrians wouldn't have a problem with inflation if all it was was an increase in the money supply that lifted all prices at the same time and people's wages rised exactly with inflation. If all prices were to rise at the exact same time and everyone received money at the exact same time, there wouldn't be a, a problem with it. But the problem with inflation is that it benefits certain people sooner. It has effects on some prices and not others. And this creates distortions in the market. Like I talked about before, prices convey information and it creates winners and losers. It also diverts money away from the real wealth producers and savers to consumers. Another way that it, that it creates distortions is that, for instance, by, by keeping interest rates low and flooding the system with money, unprofitable projects that would not normally be taken on are taken on. So this destroys real wealth. It also is the ultimate cause of the boom bust cycle. The United States economy expanded mightily in the years after the Civil War. The greatest decades of economic growth in all of American history remain the 1870s and 1880s, an era known as the Gilded Age. After the Civil War era inflation died out in the 1860s, prices gently fell by about a percent per year until the 1890s. This was a boon to savers who saw their nest eggs grow and to consumers who could buy ever cheaper consumable goods every year. But some farmers were hit hard by the deflation of this time because they had borrowed to buy land and equipment. However, the engineering revolution of this period also led to enormous leaps in farm productivity, enabling many workers to leave the farm and seek out better opportunities in urban areas. By modern standards, workers toiled for long hours in dangerous conditions. For example, the average steel factory worker worked 72 hours a week. However, the standard of living and disposable income of these working families also increased. This was especially true of new factory workers, such as immigrants and former farm laborers. A farm laborer in that era worked extremely long, difficult hours while being exposed to the elements at low pay. So for many, factory work seemed like a great opportunity by comparison. Unskilled workers saw their wages increase 44% from the Civil War all the way until World War I, and skilled workers those who knew a craft such as carpentry, plumbing, steel rolling, or even how to work with new electricity did even better. 
Under a gold standard, the monetary unit is defined as a certain amount of gold, like 1 20th of an ounce, or 10 grams. In the era of the international gold standard, before World War I, the U.S. dollar was defined as a little less than 1 20th of an ounce of gold. To be precise, one ounce of gold equaled $20.67. A silver standard follows the same idea. The British monetary unit, the pound sterling, originally meant exactly that, one pound of sterling silver. The obligation to redeem for gold guarantees the gold value of all kinds of bank-issued money, and the purchasing power of gold was historically very stable. By contrast, under today's unbacked, or fiat, dollar standard, there is no value guarantee. If you take a $20 Federal Reserve note to a bank, all you can get for it is other Federal Reserve notes. Why did the United States leave the gold standard? Basically because the gold standard constrained the federal government. The obligation to redeem in gold limited money printing at times when the federal government, rightly or wrongly, thought more money printing would be a good idea. The United States went off the gold standard in two major steps. First, in the 1930s, under President Franklin Roosevelt, the federal government broke its promise to redeem Federal Reserve notes in coin for U.S. citizens. Private ownership and use of gold coins were actually outlawed. Individuals and banks were ordered to turn in their gold coins and bullion to the Federal Reserve. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Fed printed dollars rapidly. The falling purchasing power of the dollar triggered redemptions by foreign central banks, and the U.S. government began running out of gold. Rather than stop printing dollars, Nixon ended their redeemability in 1971. The money printing then accelerated, culminating in double-digit inflation around 1980. The idea, how people think about a bank, is that banks lend out your deposits, okay? So people think, hey, I walk into Bank of America, I walk into Scotiabank, I walk into Barclays, I deposit $1,000, and they take that money, and they go and they lend it out, and they produce a rate of return on it, and based on that rate of return, they then can pay you a spread, right? This is kind of the traditional narrative that is taught about how banks make money. And the idea of fractional reserve lending is that they'll say, oh, well, the government has regulated that you can't lend out all of that, and you assume a 10% reserve rate. So you can lend out 900 of that $1,000, okay? So what they do is they lend it out. Now, when you give that loan out, that loan becomes a deposit in the depositor's bank account, okay? And typically, they're gonna lend it within the same bank, right? So now, when that depositor deposits that money back in, now the bank has another $900 they can lend against, okay? And they can't lend the full amount, they can only lend 90% of it, so they borrow, they take $810, which they lend out to the next person, who then gets deposited back in, and then it becomes 720, and so on and so on. And you could argue that, okay, this doesn't happen within a given bank because that person may withdraw the money and then they go and they spend it on something. And then that person deposits the money that they earn and then the bank can lend that money out and so on and so forth. So it kind of gradually inflates over time. Okay, that's the story of fractional reserve lending. What actually happens is that banks do not need your deposits at all to lend money. So let's say that I start a bank, okay? So I need a certain amount of bank capital. Let's just say for simple numbers that it was $10 million, okay? So I put $10 million in there. This is my bank capital. Now I'm allowed to lend based on a percentage of this bank capital, okay? So a borrower comes in and I may have no deposits at all, okay? It doesn't matter. What would happen is a creditworthy borrower would come in and I'd say, okay, I'm willing to lend you some money. Uh, I will lend you, and now there's a formula of the maximum amount that I can lend. That formula is that uh, basically you have 8% uh, is the requirement of capital that is required under typical bank uh, regulations as specified under Basel III, okay? Uh, in practice, that's not how it's actually calculated. Okay, so that 8% is kind of meaningless because what they do is they say, all right, you know, if you have an 8% requirement, right, that means in order to lend $100,000, I need $8,000. Now note, I don't need $8,000 of deposits. Deposits are not bank capital. In other words, you can go and deposit $100,000. My bank capital has increased by zero, okay? That is a liability 
on my balance sheet. It's something, it's money that I owe to the depositors. What's happening is I have my bank capital and you come in and I say, okay, great. If I have $8,000, it means that I can lend $100,000, right? Sort of. It depends on what I'm lending against. What they do is they take the amount of borrowed money and they multiply it by a risk weighting, okay? Now that risk weighting is typically uh, based on kind of the credit worthiness of the borrower, how secure the loan is. And so uh, if you had a very strong mortgage, right? Like a low loan to value first mortgage, then that's typically rated at 50%, okay? In other words, how much is it that I can lend? Can I lend 100,000 based on, or based on my 8,000? No, I can actually lend 200,000. So now you might say, well, where does the bank get this money? The answer is they create it. They just make it out of nowhere, okay? They do not need your loans. Now, you might say, well, hang on, what about these reserve requirements that I've heard about? Now, first of all, notice that reserve requirements are always dramatically lower than capital requirements, okay? So whereas the capital adequacy requirements might start at 8%, right? And then go up based on the risk weighting, the reserve requirement might be like one or 2%. In some cases, there is no capital, there is no reserve requirement, okay? It doesn't matter, why? Because what will happen is, at the end of the day, if the bank doesn't have enough reserves to meet their reserve requirements, then all they do is they go to the interbank market and the overnight market and they borrow it, okay? So yeah, there's a spread there that they need to be able to cover. And basically all of the banks who have reserves, reserves are just deposits, okay? That's what, it's a fancy word for deposits. So you say, okay, great, I have these bank reserves and they will lend them on that market, trying to get a return on them. If there's a shortage of reserves, it still doesn't prevent them from borrowing because they can borrow to, through the central bank at what, through what's called the discount window. And so they have a fixed rate that is sent there by the central bank. And so that's kind of the theoretic maximum. And so the central bank controls the interest rates by adjusting the rate that they charge uh, in the overnight market through the discount window and trying to remove and add uh, reserves into the system through the buying and selling of bonds. Open market operations, they're called. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserve. We have to trust them with our privacy, trust them not to let identity thieves drain our accounts. This is how the problem was described in 2009 by the creator of Bitcoin, going by the chosen name Satoshi Nakamoto. As Nakamoto wrote in 2009, a lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed since the 1990s. I hope it's obvious that it was only the centrally controlled nature of those systems that doomed them. I think this is the first time we're trying a decentralized, non-trust-based system. There is no better way to get a sense of what Bitcoin makes possible than to choose and download some wallet software and try it out with small amounts. Some promising initial applications for Bitcoin in the real world include payments and remittances. Remittances are especially important to those who move from poorer to richer countries to work and send money to their families back home. The few companies that provide this service at all charge surprisingly high fees and have many limitations on timeframes, destinations, and amounts. If those at both ends used Bitcoin directly, all of the hard-earned wealth sent would also arrive immediately and regardless of amount or destination. So if these Bitcoins can be so useful, where do they come from and how many are there? An analogy to metal mining has often been used, but while more gold and silver can always be discovered, the maximum possible supply of Bitcoins is already known, as is the approximate rate of mine production. All Bitcoin ore in the universe is in here. Anyone can mine any time, but finding new ore gets harder and harder and harder. There are only 21 million possible Bitcoins. Each equals 100 million Satoshis, which are the actual units. In contrast, as fiat currencies lose value, new denominations have to be printed with more zeros on them. Bitcoin has been doing the opposite. 
to understand the basics of blockchain, it's important to understand how distributed ledgers work. A distributed ledger is a collection of data with no central administrator that has been agreed upon by consensus. To understand more details, let's take a trip way back, back into 500 AD on the island of Yap. The Yapese people used a very unique form of currency, the rye stone. Each of these stones weighed around 200 kilos, making them difficult to move. To exchange them as money for goods or services, they would announce to every adult on the island who owned each stone. Each adult had to keep a mental ledger of ownership. Every time any Yapese conducted a trade, an announcement was made to the entire tribe. Each member of the tribe would then update their mental ledger. In today's description, this would be called a distributed ledger. All rye stone ownership was known to everyone, and that knowledge was updated whenever a transaction was made. So why didn't just one member of the tribe keep track of the rye stones? What if that main record keeper was sick, unable to do their job, or was found to be dishonest? If the only copy of the ledger was changed by any means, wealth would be lost or gained unfairly. The Yapis knew their distributed ledger system safeguarded it from tampering, since all the Yapis knew who owned what. It would be very difficult to fool everyone on the island. Even if one tribe member moved away, the tribe still had multiple copies of their mental ledger. In this regard, the ledger was fault tolerant and could not be easily changed, corrupted or lost. The tribe also decided that stones didn't have to be on the island to hold value. One day, a stone fell into the ocean and the Yapis decided that this stone, even though it could not be seen, still held value and could still be traded. This system of consensus by the majority of the adults on the island, with no central administrator, is one of the first examples of distributed ledger. Let's consider a major government intervention in labor markets to redistribute income, but also to make labor market outcomes more equitable, more fair. And that is the imposition of a national minimum wage by the government. Economists traditionally believed that raising the minimum wage led to job losses. Yet decades of research has led to a rethink. And today, 90% of countries have some form of minimum wage. But there is still no agreement on how high it can be without harming workers. For more than 100 years, worker revolutions and strikes fought for a minimum wage. In 1894, New Zealand finally introduced the first laws around a national base pay. America's first federal minimum wage wasn't introduced until 1938, when President Franklin Roosevelt set it at 25 cents per hour to help low-income workers during the Great Depression. But the federal minimum wage in America isn't tied to inflation and so hasn't kept up with rising prices. Over time, it's lost value and stagnated. In response to the low federal minimum wage rate, some state and county politicians raised it locally themselves. In 1991, the federal minimum wage in America went up to $4.25, about $8 in today's money. By 1992, 24 states had the same minimum wage rate as the federal one and five states had minimum wage rates higher than it. This patchwork of different minimum wage levels gave economists an opportunity to measure the real-world impact of the minimum wage. And this led to a study that turned economic thinking about the minimum wage on its head. In 1992, two economists from Princeton, David Card and Alan Kruger, looked at how changes to the minimum wage affected employment at fast food restaurants in two states with differing policies. New Jersey, where the minimum wage for workers increased, and neighboring Pennsylvania, where it stayed the same. Of course, what conventional theory would tell you at the time is, the minimum wage has gone up in New Jersey, it hasn't gone up in Pennsylvania. What you'd expect to see is employment in New Jersey to fall 
relative to employment in Pennsylvania. If you make something more expensive, people will usually want to buy less of it. And if you make labour more expensive, then employers might want less of it. And what we call employers wanting less labour in the real world is unemployment. But what Card and Kruger found is actually the opposite. Despite the wage going up in New Jersey, employment actually increased. The minimum wage is really an empirical question rather than a theoretical one. It depends on what sectors people are working in, how easily replaced by machines they are, what sort of profit margins their employers have, what their pricing power is. And what policymakers and economists need to keep in mind is that they need to keep checking the data, keep looking at different types of data, and keep examining the evidence of the impact these policies are having. Card and Kruger found that a small wage increase didn't lead to redundancies because wages were already below market rate. And why did employment increase? The higher wage may have attracted new workers to the market. The study proved, for the first time, that raising the minimum wage doesn't necessarily destroy jobs. This groundbreaking finding challenged conventional wisdom on minimum wages in America and saw similar policies spread around the world. Cards and Kruger's finding also led to a new focus on empirical or real-world data as opposed to theory. Society is what it believes. And as a society, some of our most closely held economic beliefs, the beliefs that frame our politics, our policy and our culture, are wrong and worse, they're pretty terrible for us. For example, we believed in a behavior model that holds that people are homo economicus, perfectly selfish and relentlessly self-maximizing. It's not true. We can be selfish, of course, but decades of science reveals that humans have evolved to be reciprocal and cooperative. What makes us unique isn't our competitiveness. All animals compete. It is our unmatched capacity to cooperate at scale, which has enabled our species to dominate the planet. Believing that when wages grow, jobs shrink, fundamentally mischaracterizes the economic dynamics in these systems in the same way as if you believed that when plants grew, animals shrank. We believed that price equals value. We believed that the availability of concentrated capital was the principal constraint on economic growth. It's not true. The economy isn't money, it's people. And the more people we fully include in the economy as innovators, entrepreneurs, well-paid and well-educated workers, and robust consumers, the faster and more prosperous the economy grows. Why does it matter that all these academic assumptions are wrong? Because they logically and inevitably lead to a higher level set of heuristics that has shredded our economy and our democracy over these last decades. Heuristics like, Raising wages kills jobs. Tax cuts for the rich create growth. Government is always inefficient. The market is a perfect meritocracy. Greed is good. The rich are makers, the poor are takers. And there is always a trade-off between increasing amounts of economic fairness and justice and economic growth and efficiency. So here's the thing, there's a Nobel Prize in economics attached to every single one of those ideas, and they are all wrong. Because here's the thing, if you accept these neoliberal assumptions, the truth is there is only one economic outcome that is possible. The rich will get richer and everyone else will get poor. Neoliberalism is a protection racket for the rich and the powerful. The market isn't a jungle, it's a garden. Intended like a garden, markets are the greatest social technology ever invented for solving human problems and creating prosperity. But unconstrained by social norms and democratic regulation, markets inevitably create more problems than they solve. Economic inclusion is not this liberal luxury to be afforded if and when we have growth. Economic inclusion is the cause of growth in market economies. The economy is people. The more people we include in it, the better it works. Unlike the laws of physics, 
The laws of economics are largely a choice. If we want a more equitable, more just society, if we want new economic beliefs, all we have to do is choose to have them.